This week's conversation with Lucy Martin of Lucy Martin Embroidery is sponsored by Sassy Jack Stitchery at sassyjackstitchery.com. The new shop in the Baird House is now open, and the Fiber Talk presenters have just returned from a two-day visit. If there ever was a destination shop, Sassy Jack's is it. The shop is beautiful and filled with a wide range of charts, threads, and linens, along with an excellent selection of notions. It has a ton of character and is an absolute treat to visit. Make plans with your stitching friends this summer to visit Sassy Jack Stitchery. Not only will you enjoy the needlework shopping, but the surrounding communities are filled with artists of all types and a wide variety of unique and excellent restaurants. All of it is set in the stunning Smoky Mountains. In the meantime, Kim is offering many charts at cost or below cost clearance prices. She has recorded several live shows in which you can see all of the sale charts. Take advantage of these unbeatable prices before the charts are gone. As always, you can shop for all of your needs on the website at sassyjackstitchery.com. Thanks to Sassy Jacks for sponsoring the show. And now we get to learn about the talented Lucy Martin. Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Beth Ellicott. And you're listening to Fiber Talk, the twice weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week, all the way from the UK, Lucy Martin of Lucy Martin Embroidery. Lucy, welcome. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Oh, this is going to be fun. There's so much to talk about. Now, Lucy has her own business, Lucy Martin Embroidery, but then she's also head of education at Hand and Lock. So today we're going to talk about Lucy, and then we'll come back in, I don't know, two, three, four, five weeks, something like that, and Lucy's going to help us better uh, learn about Hand and Lock, what they do, how they do it, what her role is in, in the education end of things. So we'll get another show with Lucy coming up in the near future, just about Hand and Lock, which will be equally fascinating. But uh, for today's show, there's so much about Lucy that we wouldn't be able to get to hand and lock for more than two or three minutes, and that's not right. So, no, um, no. so we appreciate that, Lucy. That's going to be fun uh, today and and the next time. Um, so much to Definitely. learn. Definitely, pleasure. Yeah. All right. Now, started embellishing clothes when you were a child. So, were you the really cool one in school who always had the neat looking clothes with the extra little things? Definitely not. I think um, it sort of came from my mum. So my mum did a lot of um, kind of, she used to work and do bridal dresses, prom dresses, things like that. And when I was little, I used to sit and watch her make these ladies who came in with like no makeup on and they hadn't got their hair done and they were there in like jeans and a t-shirt looking a little bit scruffy. And then they leave my house and look like princesses because they'd have their <laughs> glam squad in and they look beautiful. And I looked at them and thought, that's what I want to do. I want to make people feel like that. I want people to leave whatever I do. And I want them to feel like they've got a bit of magic and they've got a bit of something in there. And I think I definitely wanted to sort of look at how I could then start doing that and how I could then sort of have that within my career, my practice at what, five years old. And um, I then started to then explore like textiles and I got a GCSE in textiles and then was sort of exploring the tailoring side of things, embroidery side of things, and then really knew that I wanted to basically spend my life making things sparkly. So that's what I do for a living now. <laughs> it's, it's so interesting, though, that you, you know that when you're a child and all the things that we all go through as we grow up that that stuck with you so that that emotion it really an emotional drive then definitely and i think it's more i'm attracted to like sparkly pretty things and i think with kind of my practice i definitely think that it, it stems from I, i've like i've always loved it it's never been a question of is this the right thing isn't this not the right thing and i think i've always sort of known in me what i wanted to do and then i went to the royal school of needlework on my degree open day and I was only 14 and I walked in and there was just that like intangible feeling of like, this is it. Like, I, I don't know what it is, but this is the thing that I want to do. And I remember walking around with my parents being like, I, I, I honestly can't do anything else. Like, this is what I want to do. 
And I yeah, went for my degree interview and was thinking, well, if I don't do this, I actually don't know what I'm going to do because I, I really, really want to do this. So I'm really glad they let me let me in. So was the was the that first time you went in, was that at Hampton Court? It um, is. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. you literally study in um, King William and Queen Mary's apartment. So obviously very intimidating for a 14 year old girl walking into Hampton Court. <laughs> yeah, just a little. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was like, it, but it, it was amazing. And obviously you walk in and it's it's completely different to any university experience or any kind of college experience that you can get because you literally study in the grounds of a palace and you in the apartments, like your view is of the um, the privy gardens that are just the most beautiful landscape gardens ever. And you're walking into university behind people dressed up as Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn and it's all just normal. And I remember one of the days, my one of my uni tutors, I was like, I'm gonna be late. She was like, what, why are you going to be late? I was like, because there's a guy dressed up as Charles II doing a book signing and I can't get through. And it's one of those things that that just becomes completely normal. But, um, yeah, bonkers. <laughs> yeah, well, and I remember when I went to Hampton Court, those beautiful gates that are back behind, that are close to the um, the river. I can't think of the name of the river right now. Thames? Yeah, yeah, yeah and, the Thames, yeah. And, and so, and I remember thinking, this would be beautiful to do in gold work. At the time, I wasn't doing gold work, but I thought, ooh, those just those ornate gates um, definitely, and gold work. Definitely, definitely. It, it was actually our first year project, so we did a lot of study on heraldry and the kind of very regal side of embroidery, and it was actually, that was our first year brief. So I remember standing outside those very gates with a little notebook in the freezing cold rain, drawing the <laughs> um, the unicorns and the rampant lions and things like that. And that was sort of my first experience of heraldry. And where I work now at Hand and Lock, which I'm so sure we'll talk a little bit more about, is it the that kind of heraldry is so significant in what I do now. We're a royal warrant holding company, so you sort of I think that was my first ever experience of it. But yeah, all those motifs, all those, the beautiful kind of grandeur of the palace is, yeah, it's the best place to study in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when you go, so 14, you go to the Royal School. Did, was, I mean, obviously there's, there's intimidation there, I'm sure everywhere, just because of your age and, and what you're entering. But from a needlework perspective, were you able to dig right in or did you feel like you needed to scramble? No, I, I, had, I had no idea. So prior to going to the Royal School of Needlework, I think there's this perception that you should go on the degree program with all this experience. And I had done some embroidery, like I'd sewn a couple of beads on here and there and I got a bit of experience, but it was very much the what excited me about it was the fact that I had no idea how to do any of it. And you look at it and you go, that is stunning. That is like proper, proper like artwork. I have no idea how to make that. And I think I can, but I have no idea how to. Uh -huh. And I think starting, I remember walking around with my dad and I feel like my dad is quite a, a kind of, uh, he sort of has very strong opinions about things. And he was like, this is really cool. And I always think <laughs> that if he thinks it's cool, then it must be. But I remember seeing there was a gold work dragonfly and it was all done in cut work. And I was like, I've, I've got no idea how to make it, but I want to make it. And I want to be here and I want to learn and immerse myself in this environment and be surrounded by people who also want to be learning the same thing. And the tutors are just amazing. And you're supported on this wonderful journey over three years sort of learning not just the technical stitch I think is really important as well. So you don't just learn the technical side of things. You learn how to design, who you are. It's like a whole process over the three years that gives you a fully holistic view of what embroidery is and what embroidery is in the industry, how to then take it forward. And yeah, it was honestly wonderful. Like I cannot recommend the, the degree program at the Royal School of Needlework enough. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I've said this more than once that, that talking with people who go to the Royal School and get any kind of certificate or degree, by the time you're done, one thing you know for sure is whether you like embroidery or don't like it. Because of, of what you have to work, you know, from what we've learned, what you have to go through to get a degree or a certificate, I mean, it, it's pretty extensive. And uh, yeah, if, if, if at any point you don't like it, you're going to learn that. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah, exactly. And th there are a few techniques here and there that I will never touch ever again because I hate them so much. <laughs> and you, it's learning every single embroidery stitch. You're going to come across some that you're just like, I never want to see that ever again in my life. And there are a few techniques. I remember that silk shading was a particular one that I thought never again, never, ever, ever again. And we did the the stitching samples. And I just didn't get on with it. And then in my, in, I think it was my February of my third of my second year, and I said I'm gonna. I basically used to work all of my holidays because I wanted to get as much industry experience and wanted to work out exactly where it was that I wanted to position myself in the industry. And I did a weeks long internship with Catherine Walker, the private couturier. They do lots of kind of um, work for the royal family, and we were doing a an outfit for Ascot. So we were doing a kind of um, a suit jacket and this hat for Ascot. And I walked in on the first day and they said, we want it all to be silk shaded. And I was like, well, I, I either turn around and go home, just tell them <laughs> I can't do it, or I get my act together and make sure that I actually can do it. And they sat us down for the first day. They were amazing and gave us so much creative freedom. And I was only, what, like 19, 20 at the time. And they gave us full creative freedom of, of like how we were going to create the the pieces. And it was just me and one other girl. And we, and we silk shaded the whole front of the jacket in wow. four days yeah it was really in it was really, days. really amazing four days yeah it was really <laughs> really full on but it was amazing and ever since then I've loved silk shading and I love the kind of artistry that comes with it and that was what I ended up using for the, the majority part in my final collection which I think is really interesting because you you're given these techniques and it's like well you can use it if you want to and some of them, like I say, I really didn't get on with. But I think with silk shading, it was one of those that actually the more I did it, the better I got. And then my final collection was then full of it. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, four days. Wow. I know. It's very busy. <laughs> wow. I, I'm just so impressed that you know, you're doing this at, at 19. So look at all you've done in your teenage years when most of us are just trying to stay out of trouble. And, and you're, you know, you're accomplishing all this. I mean, what a, it, it clearly is in your blood. I mean, there's, there's, there's no doubt that it is absolutely in your blood. And then, and now you've continued and expanded on, uh, just so amazing to me because uh, you know, your typical teenagers still trying to figure out, uh, you know, <laughs> what time to get out of bed in the morning for crying out loud. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah. Thank you. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm in a very 23 now, so I've done a lot in a very short space of time. I was made the head of education at Hand and Lock at 21, so it's been a really interesting two years. And I'm so incredibly proud of what I've done. I think it's a, obviously an immense amount of work, but I, I, I cannot tell you like how much I love it. And it's not a case of I'm doing it because I need to get paid. I do it because I love it every single day. And I love, like I, at the moment, I do lots and lots of teaching. So I teach around just over 1,500 people every year. And it's grown about 500% since I started, which has just been amazing. And it's we've gone from teaching four classes every year to about 158 classes every year. So it's grown massively. Wow. And, and yeah, yeah, I'm really proud of it. Very, very proud of it. Well, you should be. You should be. Thank All you. right, let me, let, let me be the dad for a minute. When you say at 14, I want to go to the Royal School and, and, and get a degree in, in embroidery and, you know, Dad, I need you to pay for this. Uh, you know, uh, from, from my perspective, how are you going to get a job? But clearly, yeah. you, clearly you had parents that were supportive of whatever you wanted to do then. Absolutely. I cannot sing my parents' praises enough. I adore them. They are the best people walking on this planet, in my opinion. But my my mum is a CEO in education. She is uh, incredible and she supports, she's kind of a big ambassador about getting women into leadership, about um, supporting women and also kind of getting into these kind of higher education roles. But also she is a huge champion for arts and education. Um, and she so she works mostly in primary and secondary education, so kind of up to the age of 18. But she is a huge, huge champion for arts and the arts, so music, arts, drama, everything like that, textiles. And throughout my whole life, it's very much been as long as it makes you happy, you do it. And my brother's also in set and costume design. So we've both gone into very creative fields. And I think I come from this. They're just so incredibly supportive. And I think when you go to somewhere like that and you say 
I want to do this and it was it, it was the kind of visceral feeling of like I have to do this because I know this is what I, what I want to do to then not do it felt like doing a disservice to myself so I knew that I kind of had to had to do it and they were so so supportive even from 18 I'm I was very kind of bright academically as I was hopefully still am um bright <laughs> academically and got straight A stars for all of my GCSE studies to so the kind of highest level that you can get and yeah there was quite a lot of people along the way who were a bit like maybe you should do something a bit more academic maybe you should do science or technology or engineering or maths and things like that and I could have done that if I wanted to but I didn't want to so I did this instead and I think you get so many there's so many different facets as well to the job that I'm in at the moment so it definitely isn't just embroidery it's running a business it's doing your own accounts it's doing all those different things that I actually quite enjoy which I know sounds really quite boring and I think a lot of people in the creative industries just enjoy the creative side but I absolutely love like growing businesses and mentoring people and like teaching people is as much of a joy as the embroidery side so yeah, I hate that answers the question I feel like it was a bit of a roundabout way <laughs> no, no well it's it's so interesting because most people we talk to you know in, in their career we have 10 15 20 30 sometimes 40 years of work to get where they're at and here you are what 23 and and you've done all this in such a compact amount of time and have your own business head of education at hand and lock i mean that's for most people that's a 30-year career yeah and my my partner often says to me he's like just retire now you've done it like <laughs> you've, you've done everything you need to do <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But but it's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And it's also interesting that you don't you don't mind or enjoy the business end of things because that you know that's usually the hardest part for artists to learn and and what yeah. holds them back is is they just want to be artists but they need to make some money at it and they don't know how. So you've been, exactly. been able to you've been able to merge the two and 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 make it fly. Yeah, I think I really enjoy that side of things and like how you build something from the ground up, like how are you multi-layering a business? How are you marketing? How are you doing? Um, all those different creative things, like I've grown my own social media account, I've grown my own mailing list, all those different things I find really interesting alongside, which I know I'm very, I'm very, very grateful that I do enjoy all of the kind of aspects of it. The nitty gritty of the accounts I find quite difficult because I feel like, I mean, that's everyone, I think. But, um, but yeah, I, I absolutely love it. And I think the the main thing that I love is kind of growing communities and growing communities of people who appreciate stitching, appreciate fine arts. And I think you there are so many different facets that I think it's it's quite easy, I think, when you're in the creative industries to get stuck in, like, I just do embroidery and I just do this. Whereas mm -hmm. yeah. the the nice part about my job is that I get to do from one minute I'm making an outfit for a chihuahua, the next day I'm doing the inside of a private jet, the next day I'm growing a community of students and the next day I'm teaching at a beautiful museum in London. Like there's so many different things that you get to do that there isn't any opportunity to ever get bored, which is wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Right. So go ahead. So did is this the reason you started doing a mentoring program? Because you have like- Yes. Um, yes, so I think the, the kind of thing that I felt when I, left university was that I was a bit like oh, what now like what do I do now I've just graduated I have a degree in hand embroidery that's all well and good but how do you actually do how do you do anything with this so yeah I've set up the mentor the mentoring program to help individual artists actually get into the industry so how do you approach clients how do you do invoicing how do you work out what an hourly rate is how do you do all of that kind of thing and also things like portfolios like I've been in interviews with lots of different I've seen so many portfolios that there are certain things that you look for and then you see individuals portfolios and you just go mm, maybe tweak this maybe tweak that and covering letters CVs how you kind of approach an interview how you talk about your work all of those different things is so multifaceted in terms of like what you actually need to do to present yourself as an artist that I want to give people the things that it's taken me ages to work out how to do 
so that's kind of where the mentoring session comes in and it's it's amazing i've had um a, a few different clients now who are coming back multiple times so that they're kind of we're working on building a website and then we'll work on building a mailing list and then we'll work on building a social media platform so there's all these different focuses that you can have and yeah, I, I really, really enjoy it. I think that that kind of individual one-to-one -one mentoring, as much as I love the teaching, I also love that side of it as well. Yeah, it took you ages. Yeah, five years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's the like, you know, the, the difficult things that you think that was really annoying for me to sit and work out how to do that. And it was like, it's like trialing three different website providers or oh, one was much easier than the other. This is the one that I would recommend maybe. Like it's all those little things that you think it takes you time to work out every single little bit. And I think that having someone go, this is everything that I know tends to kind of help people out. And I think with, uh, especially with mentoring other artists as well, it's also nice to have a bit of a back and forth and to have a conversation with them about their experiences as well. So I'm learning through the process as well. Right. All right. This is this is intensely self-made. Uh, other than your parents, is there some mentor in there that uh, is kind of your guiding light? I wouldn't really say so. I think the my mum. I think yeah. my mum is my and my, and my dad. But like my mum is. I got to got to say that. Those little chat me. But my <laughs> mum is absolutely wonderful in terms of kind of career progression, career support. And just being there, and I think her being such a role model in my kind of as I grew up, she is like in works with the government. She like doesn't take no for an answer. Like she's just like, Abs this is what's going to happen. Kids they are the most important thing. Getting kids into art education is the most important thing. And I've seen her talk to kind of like members of parliament. And I've grown up with thinking that that's normal, having a extremely powerful incredible inspiring woman she's my mum so if she can do it I can do it is my logic and so that's kind of right. growing up in that environment where you're surrounded and my nana is also absolutely wonderful so you're sort of surrounded by these women who are just amazing and it's sort of like you can't then not in it kind of build something yourself because if they can do it I can do it it's in my genes so yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Beth, how many times, you know, has it been the environment that has made, mm -hmm. is, is so key to making these people successful, these artists? You know, time and again, we run into that. But uh, this right. is this is intense. This is quick. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I, I, you know, the creative spark that's there and, and then the encouragement, you know, sometimes it's just, yeah. you know, you hear a lot of times, uh, well, I know I heard it. You can't make, you know, there's no way to make a living out of, you know, being an artist or, are doing that you need an engineering degree you need a, a science degree and I think people forget how those degrees too are creative and you need you need more creativity and we need them in the schools we need that to be taught absolutely, absolutely. and the arts and crafts is a massive sector of the economy and I think a lot of people forget how valuable they are and there are so many different things like I work with a wonderful charity called quest who work with individual makers and there are people who do like taxidermy and sign writing and they paint on the side of boats and they do the stone masonry in Westminster Abbey like there's all these different people and everything has to be made so, so it will be made by someone and mm -hmm. you there are so many different kind of individual artisans and crafts people who are making and doing incredible things but I think a lot of it especially with kind of secondary education is that people just can't see it like you can't see if you're not shown the fact that someone who can do stone masonry and stone carving for Westminster Abbey exists, why would you know that that's a job? Why would you know at 14 that that's ever going to be a job that you can do? And I think it was, I, I think my mum was interested in textiles. That's kind of how I found out about the Royal School of Needlework and how I definitely am where I am today. But I think it is all about seeing, if you can't see it, you can't be it. So you need to be able to actually see people doing the job that you want to do. And I think there's this preconception with embroidery and textile craft that it's like, oh, my grandma used to do that or it's not cool. And I'm like, I've made something for Beyonce. Like, it is cool, I promise. And I think there's a lot of that kind of, it right. is very cool. And yeah. 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 And made something for Beyonce. You can do it. Yep. <laughs> Right. No, my, my wife and I were having a discussion the other day of, you know, where would you be if kind of thing. 
And I grew up in a, in a near Flint, Michigan, which is automotive manufacturing. And everybody graduated from high school, went to the factories, put in their 30 years, retired with full benefits and pension, and that was it. And I, I didn't want that. That wasn't just wasn't for me. But we were what we were talking about is is just what you've experienced is I never had the exposure to these other options because I was I grew up in an environment where th nothing else was considered but go going to work for the car manufacturers, and you know you, so you start to wonder what if I had had you know, uh, like your mother contact with her to see these other options and and you know where would you go with that and obviously uh, you you it works for you i mean you're 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 blessed to have such a <laughs> such a, a mother but Absolutely. also an environment that is so supportive yeah. because arts don't always get the supportive environment usually artists are ones who just fight their way through no matter what because they're just determined and, definitely, uh, definitely. I think especially with so uh, my secondary school experience was definitely really challenging. And I think there was a lot of this preconception that you do teaching, you do farming or you do uh, you become a nurse or a doctor or you go and work for JCB or Rolls Royce, which were the two companies that were kind of big around where I grew up. And they were the kind of accepted fields. And I said, absolutely not. I'm going to do hand embroidery. And I think a bit of it was the fact that I was just like, I'm going to do this no matter what you tell me. And I, they would sort of tell me like, so they put me in these like gifted groups. So all the gifted children would go and sit <laughs> and they'd all look at these Russell Group universities, like they're kind of Oxford's and Cambridge, like Harvard, all that kind of place, the places that are kind of really, you know, highly established. And I went, no, no, I'm going to go to the Royal School of Needlework. And for three years, they'd just be like, you're, you're not okay. Like, why are you not doing the things that we want you to do? And I was like, I'm not going to your sick form. I'm going to a different sick form. I'm going to study art. I'm going to do what I want to do. And I think a bit of it, I remember that I had a maths teacher who told me, she said, yeah, what is going to make you different? And why are you ever going to make anything of yourself? Why are you different? Why, why are you going to do anything with your life? And I remember leaving that math class and was like, I'll show you. And so then I went back, went back a few years later and I've actually just done a talk with um, the secondary school with the wonderful, wonderful head of textiles there, um, Jade Goodwin, who's amazing. And I did a, did a talk with them. I thought, what a full circle moment, me being able to give this talk in an environment mm -hmm. where I don't, didn't feel necessarily particularly supported. And now being able to give that back and being able to give a little bit of like, actually, this is a career that you can do. And working with Quest, I think as well to try and like push that message of like, you, you can do whatever you want to do, you do, but you have to get the message out there. Like I'm passionate about the fact that we need to tell people about the fact that these careers exist because if you don't, then they're never gonna know that it's a possibility. And it's only through my mum being like, come on, we're going for a day out at Hampton Court that I kind of saw that that was even a, a thing that you can do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. yeah. I think I think sometimes it is exposure. I I think that um, I remember um, we had a farmer friend who taught my middle son how to weld, and I think from learning how to weld, he learned how to solder. He's and he's an electrical engineer, but he learned to do that little tiny stuff from yeah. somebody teaching him just the basics of welding. I didn't know how to weld. My husband doesn't really know how to weld. But this farmer said, yeah, let's make this. Let's let's build this yeah. and we'll build it together. And if you're not exposed to any of that, I think of um, public school children here in the United States, a lot of those shop classes are gone. Um, yeah. A lot of those hands-on yeah. making things are gone. Um, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, a cooking class, the, the um, what yeah. was it called? The, the, where they make things, the guys make things out of wood. It was wood generally shop. guys. Woodshop. Wood shop. Those, yep. those classes are almost all gone. There's hardly any of them left. Well, how do you know if you'd like to make things if you don't make them, if you don't ever try? Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's a topic that I could honestly talk about all day. And I think it's probably where I would like to go with my career um, is campaigning for that because I think it's so incredibly important and people reducing the arts funding the lack of representation in government particularly of people who are in the arts is like shocking to me and it's like oh we'll just have like 
more maths qualifications. I'm like, just because you like maths doesn't mean that everyone's going to get on with maths. And it's mm -hmm. not a case of, it, it, there's just, I think, a lack of understanding of the value of arts and the value of not just for kind of earning a wage, but for like mental health and the fact that the, there's so many people that I know who just don't have hobbies. I'm like, we learn how to do some embroidery. It's great. And mm -hmm. you can, I think that there's a lack of this kind of, it's so enriching to everyone's lives. And it's it's everything that you see, like every single thing that you see that is like on Netflix or people walking down the street or even the, the seat covers on the tube are designed. And they're designed in a way that give you and uh, they stop anti -sick the anti-sickness fabric so that they don't move while you're looking up so that you don't get <laughs> like travel mm -hmm. sick when you're moving. And it's fascinating. And there's so many different aspects to everything that are designed and considered by different people that I think it, it definitely needs to be held in in better kind of stead in society. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. miss out. Yeah. We cheat. We right. cheat. We cheat our kids. Right. We don't miss out. We cheat right. our kids. By right. Not having because this. And because they lose that idea, that ability to think creatively, no matter what they're doing, if they're not doing yeah. Yeah. the crafts, the hand, it's um, you, you think differently if you can do that. Definitely, stuff, right? definitely. And I think so much of business is creative problem solving. Mm -hmm. And I think when you see it as that, like you're presented with a problem, you need to fix it. How are you going to get there? And it's often not, well, I just do that and it's fixes it. It's often a five step process that you have to go through to work out exactly how it is that you're going to get there. And it's thinking creatively doesn't just apply to making a piece of embroidery. It also applies to how are you going to grow a community of students? How are you going to keep, keep people engaged? How are you going to design a mailing list? How are you going to, it applies to everything. Mm -hmm. And I think creative thinking is so incredibly important and it's just sort of pigeonholed into this, no, it's an art thing. It's not, it applies across the whole of society. And I think people, I think a lot of creative people, there's um, a, a guy called Rory Sutherland, I don't know if you know of him, but he does a lot of kind of creative thinking around if you give a creative person a problem versus someone who is kind of very solution focused, they will come up with completely different su like suggestions to like a problem. So yeah, so it, it's, it's fascinating how I think you need both sides, you need the analytical brain, the kind of very um, maths and science technology focused brains, as yeah. much as you need the art focused brains in there, because you get both sides. That's my opinion anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. No, that's very true. Well, and, and now you, you take me back, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a magazine editor, have been for 45 years. And, and this, is, this is not going to come out right, but I'm just going to say it. The best staffs, as, as a chief editor, the best staff I ever had was all women. And the best staffs, editorial staffs that I've had, have always had at least half women. And I've, I've always believed in that. I, I've, I've in t I got to a point where I intentionally hired women and made sure they were part of it because it brought in a different perspective and a different view and often it was the creative part that a bunch of men just couldn't pull off in general. And I always felt that I had a better magazine and better content by having a mixture of male and female because of the different perspectives you bring. Same as with you know, an artist and being able to be creative, think, think outside the box. I hate that phrase, but you know, it really is that. Yeah, you know, it, definitely. It's, it, it's all, it, rather than lockstep, you know, I do math and get out of my way, I'm gonna add these up and it's gonna come out. Um, there's, there's in, in the real world, there's just so much more to it. Definitely, and I think working with different creative brains to solve one problem is really important and working with people i'm a strong believer that you should always work with people who have strengths where you have weaknesses so that you can build a stronger team overall and i think a lot of people think that when you have when you're working with people you should be working with people who are kind of strong in the same way that you are whereas if you you're kind of saying okay actually so we have a wonderful designer at 100 not called suki buzzercock she's amazing and she is like far beyond anything that i could do in design i think she's absolutely incredible so I'll work with her to do the design. Like it's, I'm not gonna try and do the design. I can't do it better than her. And I don't want to try. Like I, I, I respect massively that she has skill in that department. And I think working with people and working with different skills and working with different brains to 
solve a problem. I think that's what I at Hand and Lock I find really interesting is that when we have a problem or we have a design, it's very collaborative. And it's a very like, okay, we're making this jacket for this client or we're making this hat for this client, whatever it is. It's a very like, okay, how is this going to work with embroidery? Is this realistic in the time frame? Is this going to be? And we work across the whole team. Um, and we'll get everyone in on it so that it's it's very it's it's never like, OK, this is one person's idea from beginning to end. It's always a sort of collaborative experience, which is really nice. Well, but see there, you know, that's another uh, in your case, to your credit. But something that's so difficult for people is basically set your ego aside and yeah. mm -hmm. focus on where we have to get to where we have to get to, not where I have to get you. Exactly, and, yeah. exactly. And it, it's so important. And I think there's like, you don't have to be amazing at everything. No one's going to be 100% amazing at everything. It's just not realistic. Right. But working with people who are talented is such a privilege and working with people who are really, really good at what they do brings you up and it makes it like challenges you and means that you then become better as a creative, become better as a person. And I think you, it's invaluable. And I think there's this like, well, I have to do everything you don't. Like you can work with people who are incredible at what they do. I can design, Suki's like off the charts. So I'll work with her, <laughs> so, you know. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, yeah. right. Yeah. All right, you, you finish at the Royal School. Mm -hmm. now, now you gotta make some decisions. What, how did you go about that? Did you have a path by the time you got done at the Royal School, say, I wanna start my own business? Or was it hand and lock first? Or how did you play that game? So I sort of, when I graduated, I'd already worked for hand and lock, Alexander McQueen, Ralph and Russo. I'd already worked for all these companies because I'd been freelancing and, and I did little bits here and there. And I, I wanted in my head when I started my degree to work in a fashion brand. That was my goal. And I was like, I want to work for Christian Dior. That's my goal. And then I was like, well, I don't know how to speak French. So that's that <laughs> option gone. So either I learn how to speak French or I, you know, that's that's my number one priority. But um, I can't speak French. So I definitely don't work for Christian Dior. But I was like, okay, well, what is my Christian Dior equivalent? And at the time it was working for brands like Ralph and Russo and Alexander McQueen. And I started working there and working in a fashion brand is incredible. Like it's such an amazing experience, but the hours and the kind of the, the workload sometimes is, is extreme. Like it is very, very hard. And I think a lot of people, when you, I, I will not say that it, it is honestly amazing working there because you feel like you're really part of something and that you're part of this experience of creating history or creating catwalks or creating amazing looks for incredible celebrities. Um, but I think for me, it definitely felt like a short term thing. And I thought, okay, well, fashion for me doesn't feel like it's got a huge amount of longevity within my career. I just don't have the stamina to be doing 24 hour shifts. Like I just <laughs> can't hack it. Um, but some people do, some people absolutely love it and they go into fashion and they go, this is everything that I want to do. I want to do this every day and go for it like if you can do that then absolutely fine but I sort of left thinking I the day after I finished my university project rather than go to sleep which is what most people do I started <laughs> working at McQueen and I worked Alexander McQueen for about three months on their kind of catwalk pieces um yeah working on a lot of private client pieces but then I sort of wanted to it was freelance work so it's kind of a, a bit ad hoc but then I wanted to kind of spread and do a little bit more of my own thing and I did Honestly, when I say like literally anything, my first project when I left uh, that was like my personal project was a piece that I did for Chelsea and Bloom. And I've got this wonderful, wonderful friend, Amanda Wilgrave, who is just incredible. And she does lots of um, film floristry. And she contacted me after looking at my final collection and said, I love the flowers that you're making. Can we maybe do something together? I said, absolutely. Went to meet her at four o'clock in the morning at New Covent Garden Flower Market, which is where they do all the, they take all the kind of flowers and stuff for the film sets. And she said to me, she was like, do you want to help me with Chelsea and Bloom? And I was like, yeah, sure, I'll come and dig some mud. I was like, I have no idea what she's going to ask me to do. So I, thought I, was I, had, I had honestly got no idea. And I thought, I'm going to be sat here with a pair of scissors cutting stems off flowers. So I was like, I, honestly, I'll do it. Like, I will honestly do whatever because she's just, I wanted to be part of whatever it was. And then she told me that we were going to be working with this financial company who actually had put all this investment into this display for Chelsea and Bloom. And she said they'd got these like four meter high Japanese wooden elephants called Bert and Ernie that they'd had shipped over from Japan. 
for this installation and she's like we want you to make these massive hessian blankets wait a minute wait a minute well, back up <laughs> the, the elements are bert and ernie bert and ernie yeah bert and ernie the elephants <laughs> <laughs> and it was yeah honestly bonkers and she said we want you to make these these blankets and i was like okay cool like what do you want me to do with them and there were all these beautiful dried flowers that i was going to stitch on them and i'd moved into the a tiny one bed apartment and i had these eight meter blankets laid out on my floor like covered, the whole floor was covered in essian and it was yeah hand stitching all these tiny dried flowers all onto these blankets that were then used for the installation and it was like amazing from beginning to end and i remember when i was we did the install i moved everything over to chelsea and the heavens opened like you've never seen before and um, yeah, there's like just pictures of me like like a little drowned rat stitching these last little <laughs> bits onto this blanket. But it was one of those things that I never thought that I'd end up doing that in my life ever. And it was it was just great. And through her and through the projects that I did with her, I then met Charlotte on Instagram, who I now work with a lot. And um, she's rediscovered by, and she does lots of beautiful print work. And I work with her now a lot doing installations we've done pieces for stately homes like burley house we did a really beautiful reupholstery or a chippendale chair and there's so many amazing projects that kind of came from that and i think a lot of it is just like when you graduate my main advice to anyone graduating is just like just say yes like if there's a project that comes up just say yes to it like you just never know where it's going to take you and when i was working on the hessian blanket hand and lock said oh are you available to freelance and teach for us for one class and i was like yeah sure I'll give it a go. Never done any teaching before in my life and just turned up and did it. I was like, oh, it's not actually not that hard. And I absolutely loved it. And I said, I remember calling my mum after the first class that I taught saying, I will do this without being paid. Don't tell my bosses that. But I, was, I said, I, I will do this <laughs> and like for free is just amazing. The feeling I get from it is amazing. And yeah, the, the rest is history. With Hendon Lockwood. Wow. I'm yeah. still picturing small apartment, 25 foot uh, uh, blanket laid out in a small ridiculous. apartment. Absolutely somebody comes, ridiculous. somebody comes over. Oh, that's Bert's blanket. What? <laughs> yeah, it was. So my landlady, I'd only moved in like a couple of weeks, and my landlady came in and she was like, "What on earth has gone on in here?" And I was like, "Just, just go. It's fine." <laughs> but yeah, it's all fine now. No blankets are in here anymore. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. That's great. That is great. Oh, man. So Charlotte from Bespoke Me, um, you do collaborations with her? Is that? Yes. Yeah. So she's from Rediscovered By. So she runs her own brand and she basically creates the most beautiful, beautiful prints. And I work with her. She is the most wonderful woman. I cannot tell you. And she creates these really stunning kind of um, illustrated works. And she also does flocking and foiling. So she does kind of interior embellishment. And she has a number of amazing clients. She's just done a collection with Knott's Rugs. So she's actually transferred her prints into rugs, which are the coolest things ever. I'm trying to nab a free one to see if there's, <laughs> they've got one going because they're just stunning. But um, yeah, she does a lot of the kind of um, the beautiful print work and we do embroidered wallpapers. And with her, it's just, it's that similar process of the creative problem solving, like with the her print that she designed for Burley House. The so Burley House is like a beautiful National Trust stately home. And we so she designed the print that was based on the wildflowers of Burley's meadows outside Burley House. And then the, the colours of the flowers are the butterflies, the endangered butterflies at Burley House. And then I embellished on the top of it and then it was upholstered into the chair. So it's honestly stunning. It's, it's on my website, so if anyone wants to have a look at it, it's, it's all on there. But um, it's also on Charlotte's website, and we do lots of bespoke projects like that. So lots of kind of, if there's anything and everything, like any kind of any commission, we try and work with, and we try and do lots of different things. We've done kind of um, full drapes. I'm working with her at the moment with developing a hand and lock diploma where we're going to teach the skills as well. So you can teach the flocking, foiling, and she also does silk painting. So we're going to do a, a brief that's inspired by Impressionism. So you're learning how to do Impressionist painting, flocking, foiling, embroidery, embellishment, and everything else um, all in one unit, which is wonderful. So, yeah, she's she's probably one of my closest friends in the industry. She's absolutely wonderful, and her prints are just stunning. And we've exi exhibited together at Chelsea with lots of – and we've done, like, cushions and things. It's it's wonderful. We're probably my favourite collaboration that I've done, I'd say. 
at, oh. at the top of your uh, prospective student list, put the name Beth Ellicott, right, first slot. <laughs> I just, I, I just, my I can mind, tell, my mind I can just, tell, I can tell right there. Yeah, yeah. My mind is going, I think, okay, blocking and foiling. That's, you know, Gustav Klimt's work with all the yeah. gold work, little, I'm thinking, ooh. Yeah. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 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 Not good. We'll, uh, Lucy, we'll pause while you go write Beth Ellicott right on the list. Because you just write me right, right on top. Just put me on there. <laughs> yep. You have one. You have one for sure. All right. So you've, you've done, uh, you mentioned Beyonce, but you've uh, done work with several celebrities. Is that, is that a, a more difficult collaboration than what you've, you've been describing so far to, to work with people who, well, I, I you know, operate at such a very high level. I mean, Beyonce, I mean, come on, there's two or three people in the world who operate at her level. Uh, is is that a, a different thing, or is it the same approach to, to collaborate? It's always the same approach. I'm not best friends with Beyonce. I haven't actually met her. So there's oh, okay. any, <laughs> it, it's never like a case of you, you, most of the time you don't meet the celebrity, you meet their staff or you meet their team. Um, I did actually meet Brian May, and he is the coolest man ever. <laughs> and I'm very glad. I've been um, basically brought up on Queen. My dad's a huge Queen fan. My granddad was a huge Queen fan. I, I went to see them at Live Aid. So it was very much a, this is Brian May. It's so yeah. cool. Um, yeah. And it was, yeah, a proper moment when, um, yeah, when he kind of popped up through the stage. The design was done by Liz Cook and um, Mafalda, who worked at Hand and Lock at the time. And they, but they created this beautiful um design piece with all this kind of silk threads and things and it was for the platinum jubilee party at the palace and i yeah had the the honor of kind of helping kind of blend some of the motifs through over the scenes and things like that just before the the concert and yeah i told everyone i was like oh there's this piece by the done it for brian may it's amazing um but yeah i think in terms of the actual collaboration process i think some clients i think in terms of the clients whether they're a celebrity or they're not a celebrity it's it's the same and okay. you sort of approach it. Some people are very, very difficult. Some people are very, very nice. Um, it very much depends on the project and the piece. I'd say a lot of people, it very much depends on the the kind of project that so some people come in with like a really clear idea of what they want to have. Some people come in and they go, I want embroidery. And you go, great, can you narrow it down? Like there's <laughs> so many different types. So you have to kind of pull all the samples out and then show them and then it's, it's a process from the beginning to the end. So it very much depends. Um, but yeah, it, it's kind of treated in the same way. So you, it, sometimes you get more creative freedom than with others. So for example, like anything that you do for the royal family or for the military, it's very strict. There's no creative freedom whatsoever. It's very much like you will stitch this and it will be done for this day and this is how it's gonna look. Um, but again, there is a the, like that is just incredible as well because you get to stitch literally part of history. Like you're doing stuff for right. coronation, um, it's amazing. It just yeah, every single client. I'd say we treat every single client the same, but the process is very very different. It's a bespoke service every time, so you're treating every single one as a bespoke kind of service mm -hmm. from beginning to end. So that ability to set your ego aside it pays off for you every time then. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's if you you can't get like to it, it's you're you're not the client. Like I'm I'm not Brian May. I'm not Beyonce. Like I'm the person who's creating. I my main thing is that I love embroidery. I love the making. I love to do the embroidery, but I'm not like a superstar in the world. Like I I I don't think that kind of having any form of ego around it is helpful in any way like it's yeah. it's a business thing you're working with someone on, on a design you're developing a design with them and you're helping realize their dreams through embroidery you're not there to be like well i'm really good at embroidery no no one cares if i'm really good at embroidery i think it's more <laughs> it's it's about the client and what the client wants yeah right we care we care <laughs> <laughs> two two people two people care a lot <laughs> we do we do yeah I was fascinated, uh, uh, two, two, we're, oh, we're going to run out of time. I hate this every time. Um, <laughs> outdoor installations, okay? You did uh, Ariadne's Thread, uh, uh, Coronation, outdoor installations. What are the challenges when you, when you know a piece of your work is going to be out in the weather, and particularly UK weather, which is rarely sunny and dry, <laughs> what, do you have to take some extra steps there to make sure that it holds up? 
say if I was going to be paying for it, then I wouldn't use metal threads and I wouldn't use things that were going to tarnish. But I'm obviously not the client. So there's a lot of different things that um, you tend to sort of work with. So, for example, think for things for the coronation, because they are 2% metal, they are 2% gold. They will tarnish if they get wet, but you just make another one for the next time that there is kind of a ceremonial event. And you can often like dry them off and they don't tend to get too damaged. I think in terms of, it also looks really beautiful, I think sometimes when you do get the tarnish effect on there and you do get that kind of the patina when the, the metals do start to tarnish can look really beautiful. But we do say to clients like maybe avoid using metals, maybe avoid using things that are gonna get like, you know, soaked with Chelsea, for example, it was a very, the, the dried flowers, they were there for like five days. It was beautiful weather and everything was fine. But they, yeah, they had like this option to raise this like canopy thing over the top so they wouldn't get wet. So they're often in situations where if there is wet weather, they'll probably be bought inside anyway. So it's never normally a massive issue. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, there was just the picture on your website of the, the banner flag hanging outside. And I thought, oh, all that work and it's just going to pour rain yeah. on it and oh, yeah sometimes yeah. sometimes it is so they they are actually still hanging outside and some so i pass them on my walk home um they're the burberry flags that are hanging outside regent street and i do feel a bit like oh they're getting soaked every time we walk past them <laughs> oh, but, um, but they, they look hurt. remarkably good they look remarkably good for having been out in in the wet weather so okay yeah. well, that's good to know good to know yeah hmm. your your own personal design work your stump work is beautiful you know, to to die for <laughs> it's just gorgeous do you do, do you have to fit that in i mean all these things you're doing the the you're just your personal design work for your kits and for you is it something you just squeeze in or do you set set, set time aside so you can focus on it i think a bit of both i don't feel like there's any I think a, a lot of the, the kind of conversation is like, do you have time to like have creative freedom in your spare time? Do you have time to make it home? I have plenty of outlet for it at work. Like I definitely don't need more. And yeah. I'd say with the kits, it's, I absolutely love making kits and I love kind of getting them out there. I think it's more of a process of like, it's, it definitely takes a long time to get a kit from beginning to end because I want to make sure that they are like beautiful and that every single step is explained. But I think it's it's definitely one of those things that I really like doing it as much as I like doing the mentoring sessions, as much as I like doing the the kind of other things. And it's just this multifaceted thing that it's it's just one. It's it's an, an, another thing that I just enjoy doing. So I do it occasionally. So it's never a kind of I don't ever put any pressure on it and I never sort of go, OK, well, I have to make this kit by the end of the year. It's like, oh, OK, well, I might like to make this so I could make that into a kit. OK, I'll make it into a kit. It's never a kind of pressure situation, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Technical question here. In some of your stump work flowers, you'll have uh, silk shading on some petals, and then some, all you do is the wire edge, and then yeah. and you just have the fabric in the middle, and it's, it's such a beautiful contrast, and it really makes the silk shading pieces come out. Uh, something that you developed or come from someone else all my ideas so with there's no like this is how you make a uh, stump work clearly i mean there is now because i've made one but the there is no <laughs> like there's no step by step or there wasn't a step by step when i did it and i think that is that creative problem solving so that's what i really love in every kind of aspect so i think uh, what i l love more than anything and the, the kind of the the epitome of my practice is looking at a flower or looking at a piece of um kind of sculpture or looking at it and going okay how do i make something that looks like that in thread and it's it's got to a point now with the sculptures that i'll have them like on the side and they're like oh nice flowers i'm like no no they're embroidered look at them like actually spend <laughs> some time like uh, i tried really hard um but there are, there are lots and lots of different things but i think it's there are so many different um techniques in there so it's not just there's the silk shading, which creates the really beautiful kind of outlines. But I also, within that terrarium that I made for my final collection, there's also handmade lace that I'd actually taken my granddad's drawings. My granddad used to do a lot of drawing. I actually took his drawings, drew them out, and then made lace from the drawings using oh. water dissolvable mm -hmm. fabric and then used a wire edge. There's so many different things that I kind of did with the, there's like gold work in there, there's passing thread, there's 
um, yeah, dissolvable bits, there's metal threads, there's all these kind of different things that make up that terrarium. And I think that's what I really enjoyed is like, okay, you can have like artistic flowers or you can have flowers that look like real flowers. I think my my personal favorite, I think is probably the lily because I think it was one of those that I looked at it and went, I think I can make that in embroidery. And then I did and was like, that looks really cool. And I think there's that that is the kind of process that I really, really enjoy kind of making making things that are supposed to look like things in embroidery. And then also just making things, making things sparkly, as I said at the very beginning. Um, so yeah, I think it, there's so many different techniques that go into it, and I yeah, there's it's like a whole chasm of of technique that you can kind of you know it's a degrees yeah. worth. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, those flowers are spectacular, really. really yeah, cool. they are. Yeah, yeah. All right, you got to choose gold work or stump work. So hard. Um, I knew. I'd I knew. Say... <laughs> I'd probably say gold work now because I think I do it more often and I think there's I've sort of learned through being at hand and lock the true potential of it and I think when you're working on projects that you can they create texture like I've never seen in metal threads and I think it that re I find that really inspiring and I think with stunt work I think I can personally be very creative with it but with gold work I think it's fascinating to see how the history of it and the the kind of where the designs are rooted like at hand and lock we have a huge archive of all our, of the, all of the kind of archival drafts that are the military drafts all of the royal family drafts things like that and you look in there and there's pieces that you touch and they just disintegrate because they're so old and you I, th I find that just fascinating and the history of the company, the history of gold work embroidery, I'd say at the minute is what I'm finding really, really interesting and in how you can kind of take metal threads and do so many different things with them. I'm still work like learning with gold work and learning the difference. Like I I've done gold work at the Royal School of Needlework, but I've not done gold work like Hand and Lock do gold work. Yeah. And I think over the past two years, I've been finding that fascinating, like learning the different techniques that Hand and Lock uses. And it feels like it's it's just this never ending like possibility that you have, like you can create all sorts of different techniques with it. It's just beautiful. It seems like it's getting more creative, don't you think? I mean, people are kind of I remember when I first saw gold work, it seemed very constrained or it was very, it was the traditional. And now I see much more, or maybe it's just because of who I'm following on Instagram. It's, um, it's expanded, very, very creative use of the metal threads. Definitely, definitely. And I think that's where we're trying to push the classes. So with our classes at Hand and Lock, that's where we, we're trying to make them sit is in that contemporary industry relevant exciting like gold work is so cool and you can do so much with it and I think with I think a lot of it is like oh it's just gold and it looks like this because it's been done at this time whereas now you can get it in neon and it's silk wrapped and it's like textured and it's you know adorning a flag that's going to hang outside but there's all these different things that you can do with gold work that I didn't even hadn't even considered so we've got classes with like different museums and we're making little starfish and little fossils and we're making like all these different things that you can create sculpture with metal threads, which is just fascinating. And I think the the kind of the creative side of gold work I absolutely love. And I think you can there's it doesn't have to be like gold and silver and copper. It can be like, as I say, like neon or antique or whatever you want it to be and yeah you can literally go like you can make it with whatever metal you like as well it doesn't have to be gold you can make it with platinum if you want to if you want to be you know got a bit of money to spend then go for it <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yes uh, mm. all right one last one here you've got so much going on and the pandemic i think uh, taught us uh, the real value of work-life balance. I mean, it, 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 we, it was a topic, but it became one, uh, especially after the pandemic. With, with all this going on, do you have to work hard to find some balance in life to get away from it, to get a mental break? I'm sorry. I think the, the difficulty with it is, is because I love my job so much and I love what I do, and I love embroidery, I think I've had to be quite strict with myself and be like, okay, don't just do it all the time because it's tempting to do it all the time. But then you get to a point where you're like, I'm actually just doing it all the time. Like there's just so much embroidery. Right. And I think with, uh, like I really 
find value in kind of just recharging and making sure that I'm like getting outside. I'm, you know, embroidery is quite sedentary. So like getting outside, going for a walk, making sure that I'm not just sat on my bottom all day. I'm actually going outside. (laughs) And there's a lot of kind of, I think, I'm trying to do a lot more kind of active hobbies. So I'm doing like a little like kayaking and all sorts so that it's like actually getting outside and going into the fresh air. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to stop thinking about whatever it is that you're kind of creating. I think the time off is almost more important than the time on because you actually get the time to think about things and go, oh, actually, that's the solution to this problem that I've been working on or that's the maybe I try this, maybe I try that, maybe I look at this. And I think like trips to, I live quite close to Kew Gardens, trips to like places like that, where it's just just full of inspiration. And you walk around, you might go, oh, actually that picture that I took three weeks ago to that place that I visited, maybe I look at that or maybe, and just like talking about things, like like, I often just like go for a walk with my partner and we do like, you know, like countryside walks in um sorry near where we are and there's a, a lot of the time it is just that kind of like talking things out and being like okay this is what I'm thinking what do you think of this and talking to my partner's in finance and he obviously doesn't tend to do much embroidery um <laughs> in finance and he like well, you, loves you went to the other you went to the other end of the spectrum didn't you <laughs> I know I know exactly um but it's, it's really useful to hear his perspective on things because obviously he's not in the field and hearing someone who's not in the field go what about this solution when I I was talking earlier about that different creative minds and different analytical brains coming together to solve the same problem I often find really useful to hear his perspective because he's coming at it from a completely different perspective and he's going have have you thought about making it into a spreadsheet for example and I'm like well maybe we try that so there's lots of different examples and different ways that you can um you can kind of break down a problem and I think there's like even creative things like have you thought about doing it this way or this way or I really like that but maybe add like orange in there like there's just different perspectives I think are really really Mm -hmm. useful and taking the time off to spend with people who are like not just solely in embroidery all the time I think is definitely really helpful and it also provides the perspective I think as well like having the time off to realize that you've just done something for the coronation of King Charles III and that's quite (laughs) cool and I think sometimes you need that. (laughs) Right. Yeah Uh, that had yeah, to be involved in something like the coronation or anything with the royal family has to be, I mean, intimidating. I'm sure there's a, an element of that, but just the honor and, it's and to amazing. see an event. It know, is to, amazing. You know, that, yeah. That's my part in that event. That's, yeah. I did that. Yeah. yeah. It, it gets really annoying for everyone who's watching it with you when you're like, I did that. I did that. I did that. It's really irritating. So <laughs> that's the only thing. I will definitely, right. I'll definitely talk more about that and more about the kind of role with Royal Warrants and kind of the history of all that kind of thing in the hand and lock talk that we do. So if anyone is interested, not that I'm linking it here, but you know, if you're interested, we'll definitely do a talk about it. And um, yeah, I can give more information about that and the, the process of it and all that kind of thing. Yeah. In yep. the next one. All right, That'd Lucy. Wow. What a ride. What a ride. Mm-hmm. Applause <laughs> to you. That's just a, uh, yeah. Bravo. Bravo. Um, all right. Thanks for your time. Uh, and then we'll be back now in, in just a few short weeks here and we'll learn about hand and lock and all that goes on there, which I'm sure is equally fascinating. Uh, congratulations to you. It's LucyMartinEmbroidery.com is her website. Go there and drool over the work. It's, it's incredible. Yes. It's absolutely incredible. Really impressive. All right, Lucy, thanks so much. And thanks to everyone for listening. Thank you. Thank you.